Well, the people in Hong Kong are uh, certainly have had enough by this point. It seems that uh, a lot more people are becoming increasingly defiant. Uh, the uh, the protests seem to be getting uh, less peaceful. Of course, it might just be because there are more people, so you end up with more violent people, even if you know perhaps the uh, uh, the ratio of violent to peaceful people has stayed the same. But in a way, the protesters have become more violent by default. In that, you know, violence by the uh, by the stance of the government would be uh, protests that are illegal and that uh, you know people just doing things that are outside the law, not necessarily uh, people who are smashing windows. Uh, and uh, a lot of protests, uh, protesters, um, in addition to protesting without a permit uh, this week, uh, have been breaking the law by protesting while wearing a mask. And of course, the idea. Uh, is that uh, if you wear a mask when you're protesting, you'll conceal your identity, so it's harder for the police to hunt you down and arrest you later or blacklist you or send you to a gulag. Now, on Friday, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the head of government in uh, Hong Kong, um, I forget her exact title, but her name is Carrie Lam, and uh, she decided to uh, issue an imperial decree. Now, they don't call it that, but that's essentially what it was. Um, you know, in the U.S., we'd call it an executive order. And she said, uh, hey, you're not allowed to wear masks anymore. <laughs> no siree. Uh, can't can't conceal your identity like that. And this applies to uh, to everyone, including uh, you know like journalists wearing gas masks. There were videos of the police uh, going up to journalists and telling them they have to take off their masks because uh, you're not allowed to wear masks in Hong Kong. Now this is terrible right before Halloween uh, to ban masks, but uh, that's just the way it is right now. I guess Halloween in Hong Kong is canceled. Now, the people in Hong Kong uh, who have been protesting are quite furious about this. Carrie Lam, I'm sure, was hoping that by banning the masks, she would deter people from protesting because if they can't protest with a mask, uh, well, then, uh, you know, they're not going to act up as much. They're not going to want to get in trouble. So people are just going to go into hiding and, uh, you know, pretend like they were never protesting at all. Uh, but that didn't happen. Uh, people are furious that she's trying to ban masks. Uh, they think that this is a, a gross um, uh, sort of uh, restriction of free speech, and that they're it's very clearly trying to intimidate them, and that they're uh, they're not going to be intimidated. Uh, a lot of people, though not all of them, are wearing masks, you know, despite the ban. Of course, if you don't get caught wearing the mask, um, you're probably going to end up okay because the whole idea is they can't ID you. And it seems like these protests uh, against the mask ban uh, shot up in within minutes of Carrie Lam announcing the mask ban. Seems like there's nothing uh, that uh, the government can do to try and tamp down on these protesters short of uh, capitulation. Uh, and in fact, there was one uh, Wall Street Journal reporter who tweeted out a, a video of uh, you know thousands of people walk, marching down the street in Hong Kong, and he said um, uh, just five demands, uh, not one less. Meaning that uh, these people probably aren't going to stop until they're the you know the five demands that have been circulating of the protest movement. Of course, that was you know not made by any centralized committee. I don't think that they really have much uh, leadership uh, when it comes to this whole Hong Kong thing. But they are they, they do seem pretty well organized, and a lot of people seem to have lobbed globbed onto those five uh, those five demands that were put out. And uh, I think it's probably true that until all five of them are met, that these protests are not going to stop. And uh, the uh, the uh, domestic government of Hong Kong doesn't have the authority uh, to uh, even uh, meet the demands. Uh, that would have to be from you know Beijing allowing them to uh, to to give in to the protesters. And I don't think that the the uh, the communist government in Beijing has any interest in doing that. Uh, you know they worked all, a long time to make sure that they were going to be able to to get Hong Kong. Um, in uh, what was it, 1997? It was handed over. They they were setting the groundwork for that for decades. Um, so they're not going to give it up so easily. Even though Hong Kong's not nearly as as important as it used to be, uh, given that uh, uh, you know the rest of China has gotten so much richer and that Shanghai is back to being a you know a, a, a I guess you could say a great city uh, by world standards. Um, obviously, it's still under you know communist domination, so it probably isn't a, the greatest place to live. Um, but you know, Shanghai before uh, the communist revolution was, uh, you know, pretty much the uh, the capital of Chinese industry and the Chinese economy. And a lot, what happened um, after the communist takeover was a lot of those people, the business leaders of Shanghai, fled to Hong Kong uh, because it was sort of the only part of China left that wasn't under communist control. And so Hong Kong was the beneficiary of all of Chinese industry, uh, which fled the country, uh, you know, wanting to escape Mao and, uh, you know, and all the, uh, 
all the death and destruction and famine uh, that, uh, that he created. So it's no wonder that uh, the people in Hong Kong don't want to be under uh, communist domination. Their forefathers didn't either. And so as we see things um, continue to go on, uh, the situation only escalates. Uh, the protesters are only getting more serious and more violent and, uh, and less, less open to compromise. And uh, it's gotten to the point to where these past few days since the mask ban, a lot of companies in Hong Kong have just been telling their workers to stay home, which has brought the economy uh, to uh, not quite a standstill, but uh, uh, it's certainly hindered it quite a bit. Uh, it will be very interesting to see what all the, uh, the uh, economic data looks like coming out of Hong Kong um, you know, as a result of all these protests. But uh, some people did brave it and try to, try to go to work. There was one banker who works for J.P. Morgan uh, that I saw who got beat up by some protesters when he was trying to walk into work because uh, he went and, uh, and uh, said, I believe his line was, we are all Chinese, uh, and that made people quite upset, which, I mean, historically speaking, most people would, you know, outside of Hong Kong would consider the people who live in Hong Kong to be Chinese people. But Chinese, obviously, in the broader sense, um, chi not Chinese in the sense of being a part of communist China. In the same way that you know people in Taiwan are Chinese or people in Singapore are Chinese. You know they're not a part of the communist government, but they're they're part of the um, you know what it means to be Chinese. Kind of in the way that Austrians are German or that Swiss are German. Uh, but the protesters uh, interpreted what this man said, and it may very well be what he meant, uh, that uh, by saying we are all Chinese, it's like saying that uh, we are all loyal to uh, you know the communist government in Beijing. And so he got clocked in the face uh, and uh, was kind of stuck in a corner uh, for a few minutes. I, I don't know what ended up happening to him. I assume he was able to get through the door uh, and, and get started at work. It's a pretty w crappy way to start your morning, having to go right in and then work all day for eight hours. Now, the protesters also shut down uh, the trains in Hong Kong, uh, at least quite a few of them from what I understand. Uh, they've been uh, vandalizing them, smashing windows, and uh, graffitiing them uh, with lots of uh, uh, revolutionary language. Uh, so th that also has hurt uh, Hong Kong because, you know, the, it's a pretty busy place, kind of like New York. You don't really want to drive everywhere. Uh, you you want to take the train if at all possible, and there are a lot of people in Hong Kong who, uh, um, you know, most of them I'm sure I'm certain don't own a car. Um, so that means with the train shut down, all these people would have to cram into, uh, you know, the cabs, and that's just going to slow the economy down even more. Um, the the protesters really are are um, are are hitting uh, the authorities where it hurts, I think, by harming the economy. Now, last but not least, there were some protesters who uh, apparently uh, built a catapult out of bamboo, of all things, uh, which I thought was uh, – that's a very uh, sort of um, East Asian uh, sort of thing you wouldn't see uh, with uh, protesters in North America. You certainly wouldn't see uh, Antifa uh, building a catapult out of uh, bamboo. I thought that was kind of humorous. But apparently the bamboo was uh, was recycled from some scaffolding that was around there, and that I found even more strange, that they built scaffolding out of bamboo. It sounds a little unsafe to me, but um, what do I know? And so they built this catapult and set it up behind some barricades, uh, and were using it to uh, war, you know, to keep off the police. They were in a battle. Uh, again, this, uh, this would be a great time if uh, Hong Kongers had uh, you know, the right to bear arms. Uh, it would have been a great time when they would have needed their guns. Alas, that is not the case, however, and uh, the people in Hong Kong are, uh, like I say, I still think that they're stuck. Um, until we have a situation like you know, the storming of the Bastille, uh, where uh, the, uh, the protesters are able to storm into some, uh, some military or police installation and get a hold of some weapons, they're not really going to be able to um, effectively battle the government. Uh, we've seen a couple cases to where protesters have tried to grab uh, the, uh, the revolvers away from uh, the cops, which, again, won't do them much good because uh, – you know, it holds six shots, and they probably, you know, and in, in the struggle of trying to get the gun away, the guy's probably going to shoot a couple of times. And then, so what? You've got four shots left, and you have nowhere to buy ammo. Uh, so that's kind of a tough thing. Stealing, stealing um, a, a gun off of a cop and running away is not a long-term strategy for arming your revolution. Uh, they're going to have to, like they, like the time that they stormed into uh, the uh, uh, the uh, na well, not a national assembly, whatever they call it, the Hong Kong Regional Assembly building, uh, in which they hoisted up a British flag, which is kind of funny. Um, they're going to need another situation like that, to where they storm a building, they seize a bunch of arms, then they go back out and they disperse, 
and then all of a sudden you've got a bunch of people in Hong Kong who are armed uh, that can uh, maybe fight against the police next time, and then you'll see more, uh, you'll see violent street battles, and of course that wouldn't be good, I don't want people to die, I'm just saying that if they want to progress, that's what they're going to ha have to end up doing, because the government's not going to capitulate. Uh, the Chinese government is uh, not going to uh, give up uh, eventually, you know, because they know that they have all the strength in this situation. They've got all the guns. They don't have to listen to these people. So with that said, if you gained anything of value out of this video, I'd appreciate you clicking that like button and sharing this video. And if you haven't already, uh, please do subscribe because I do upload every day and I'd hate to have you miss one. So I'll see you folks back here tomorrow.